please. You know, I could read this whole bio, and it's no. a very impressive bio. No, it really is. <laughs> it, it really is an impressive bio that will take like 15 minutes to, uh, to read through it. But the really cool part of this whole bio is he did something with TMZ, and that's really, really neat. <laughs> well, I just want to give something back to the world. I find TMZ is the kind of humanitarian organization <laughs> that I think we all can agree really makes the world a much kinder and more understanding place. And on that note, please welcome Steve Cantor. Okay. Don't you want people to have like timing? Like I had all time in the world to drink I, no, some water. See, I gotta take this, otherwise okay. I can't take pictures. Ah, good. All right, I'll work it out. All right. So, um, like you said, my name's Steve Cantor. I've actually been an avid editor for 20 years now. Um, which is a long time, but not as long as uh, probably some of you in this room, maybe. Is there anyone here who's been on Media Composer uh, longer or long time? So these are tricks and stuff I've picked up uh, mostly from other editors, uh, sometimes by uh, reading. Um, I work for Avid now as a contractor half the time. I split uh, the rest of my time um, working as an editor. Um, but, uh, you know, as of this point, you know, you can read all the books you want and take all the classes you want, but there are all these tiny little things that probably instructors don't even know. You only learn this from being on the software a long time and running into people who've been working with it for a long time. Everyone has a different bag of tricks. So I'm gonna to try to go as quickly as possible. Uh, first it was gonna be 10 tips and tricks and then it started expanding. So I was like, all right, 20 for 20. 20 tips for the 20 years I've been an editor. Now I've got like, probably 25 to 30 different topics, each of which has a bunch of subtopics. So I'm gonna to try to go through as many as I possibly can in the next 30 minutes. Uh, and these aren't necessarily gonna help you um, be a better editor, except in a couple cases, but they are gonna help you work faster and uh, make some of those decisions that you need to make. All right, so uh, thank you for turning off and saving power, iPhone. This is where my notes are. So it'll be a slight pause every once in a while. So here's uh, the first part. Uh, in the select project window, uh, we have a bunch of projects, uh, some of which I just create, uh, you know, uh, like Shane did, um, to do, you know, different uh, frame sizes or conforming for different frame rates. Uh, that's what those projects for. But let's say I don't need them anymore. Did anyone know you can actually delete projects from inside this window? All right. I'm on a laptop, by the way, so if you wanted to write down any of these tips, sometimes I'm going to give the laptop shortcut because you have like the function key that you have to hold down for something. I think this is one of them. Uh, but on a regular keyboard, if you use the forward delete key, when you select a project and hit uh, on my laptop function delete or forward delete on the uh, regular computer, you get, are you sure you want to delete the package project and all its contents? Yes, I do. And that's all gone. Um, that was actually something I learned a long time ago and then forgot for about a decade. And then <laughs> it came back to me while I was like, oh, I wonder if you can still delete projects from inside this window. Um, another thing is uh, I'm going to create a new project now. Uh, this is a little bug on the beta software. <laughs> was, really? Oh, I've never seen this one before. This, is this because of the ninja? Thank you. All right. Don't know what that was. It's uh, a ninja. Paging, it's paging uh, it's Avid. Ninja. All right, so I'll just call this the Lassie Pug project because everyone usually does that, and I'll just make it 1920 by 1080. But do you notice how the OK button has kind of a highlight around it? That's the button that's tied to the return key. So I don't have to go move my mouse and click, always the slowest way to do anything. I can just hit return. Now, if the option in question is not the option that I want, like here's quit, not highlighted, here's OK that is highlighted, you can tab between them. Using your tab key, I'm actually choosing a whole bunch of different things. And shift tab goes backwards. You can tab or shift tab and then hit return. And that's like a nice easy way to um, work a little bit faster. Um, I miss this sometimes when I'm working with Premiere where I have to do a lot of clicking uh, and there's not as much keyboard shortcut stuff. All right, uh, so I'm in the project right now. Let me just take this default bin that always gets created and I'll put it somewhere. Here, let me get, do my, uh, 
window arrangement or workspace. And boy, do I spend a lot of times in Media Composer trying to resize windows and get them to just perfectly snap. That's one of my features I'm looking for in a future version of Media Composer. All right, now I gotta get some stuff in here. So what I like to do sometimes is, you know, minimize some of the windows so that I can go to the finder level and find some footage that I wanna get. All right, so I could go into training media here and uh, oh, I don't know, here's some media in here. Here's some say source audio, right? Uh, just like in Final Cut and most other applications, I can drag and drop to do an import. All right, and then that's just been transcoded into the Avid codec. Uh, not a lot of people know that you can option drag from the finder level and actually use that to, uh, sorry, to link to things, not to AMA link to them anymore, but to link. Uh, so that option drag is kind of a nice technique. But here's something I think most people do not know, and I always get kind of some oohs and ahs when I'm on site and I show people this. So let's say here it is the import dialog, and I open it and I'm trying to find something. Oh, but wait a minute, I already found it. I already found my footage way down here in this finder window. Well, did you know that you could take the folder icon that these uh, folder these files happen to be in and you can drag and drop it into the dialog and it feeds that path into your dialog. If I grab just these items that are already selected and drag them into the window, they are pre-selected. So a lot of applications have much more cumbersome ways of getting to your media in the application than the Mac OS Finder. So I really like using the Finder uh, to help myself out. Uh, so again, this is not unique to Media Composer. This is actually any uh, Apple app. You can uh, drag paths uh, to feed those in there. And again, if I wanted to import these right now, I guess I would. Uh, another importing thing that I think is quite fun, let me just create a new bin. I'm gonna call it bin, because I'm creative. All right, and then I'm gonna go to the fabled Avid Media Files folder where all of the media is transcoded into individual folders and stuff. And uh, probably most of us are used to going in here every now and then and trashing the database files, right? Am I right? Do they suck? Yeah. Ugh, stupid <laughs> database files, man. Well, I saw this once uh, at a post house called uh, Digital Film Tree. I wish I could remember the name of the guy because I want to give him credit, but uh, do you know, uh, if you try to drag and drop a file that's an Avid MXF file, put it in your bin, that doesn't work. Has everyone ever, anyone ever tried that? All right, but everyone loves in Final Cut or Premiere being able to just drag things from a finder window directly into your bin. Well, this database file is Avid's catalog or index of this entire folder. So if you drag an MDB file into a bin, it will instantly put the entire contents of that bin into your folder. Um, this can be really cool when you, um, you know, don't necessarily know what's in a folder. So like I named something here 505, like I don't know what that footage is, <laughs> you know, 505. All right, so I'm going to, let me, oops, not enough. I want to, I'll just create a new bin, why not? And I'll call it new bin because I get more creative as time goes on. Uh, actually, it's because I'm a man, I can't multitask, I can't say one bit of words and type a different bit of words at the same time. So that's what that is. All right, so 505, I don't know what this stuff is. I drag in my media database folder and now I can instantly start, you know, taking a look at this. And, oh, it's some skiing. All right, now for those of you who are unaware, this is called snow and you're gonna need to explain this to your children because they're never going to see it <laughs> if they grow up here. Uh, all right, so those are a couple of different ways of getting stuff uh, into your Avid project you might not have known about. Um, does anyone already know some of these? Some of these new? Hopefully there'll be some oohs and ahs at some point. All right, I'm gonna close this project, open up another project, everyone's favorite thing in Media Composer, having to switch projects. Uh, the project kind of conforms stuff on, uh, you know, basically import or as soon as it uh, shows up. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go into a bin of media, maybe sources. Oh, I opened the wrong one. Oh well, I'll do this one, I'll do it with this. So here's a whole bunch of clips and a whole bunch of metadata. We all love metadata. Um, does everyone know how to create a custom column? 
Does anyone? It's with a little dance. Like if I want to make more room for scene one, I have to drag this disc label over a little bit to kind of make room for a new column. Or sorry, to make room. And then I can click up here in the column header area and just type in the name for my custom column. I'll just call it, I don't know, source. Okay. And there's my source column right there. Um, now, if I had to go through here, say, and let's say Dinah, here's the source, I could copy and paste from one field to another. We're all probably used to that. Uh, if there is something in the column, if you hold down the option key, you can click and you get a little pop-up menu that'll help you uh, choose what's been added there so far. So let's say there was a Dyna underscore zero zero six, right? So the next time I option click, I get both of those options. Uh, unfortunately, I used to do this in Final Cut a lot. I wanted to select a whole bunch of things and give them all the same name, but this option clicking thing is really only gonna work on one clip at a time. So this is a really, I think, super secret technique because even knowing how to do it, I forget how to do it, all right? So here's the trick. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this to make sure you get it uh, correctly. Uh, now I could select the source column and right click on it and get certain options or select, again, the column. So the column is highlighted and I could right click and I'll get some options, but I will not see the option I'm looking for unless I select the clips that I maybe want to change. And I'm you know, doing a couple different techniques, command clicking to select individual ones and whatnot. Now, if I go to the source one column and right click in that column, I can choose set source one column for selected clips. And I'll just make that the Dyna girl, I don't know. And are you sure? Again, I don't have to point and click at that, right? Because I can hit return, and I've now put that in that other column. Uh, I could also select an entire column. Let's say this was the disk label column, or it was the real column in Final Cut Pro, but it has to be in a tape column or a video column in order for it to be tracked properly or for things to relink properly. You can select a whole seat, sorry, a whole uh, column, and in this case, they don't even give you a button or a shortcut or anything. You just have to know if you hit Command D for duplicate, it then pops up with a list of all the different columns that you could copy that information to, including, uh, what did I call mine, source? Wow, is that some small text. <laughs> all right, and then there we go. I took all that stuff there and I put it there. Um, and then I found out a little trick if I don't really like that, I'll just call this the erase column, all right? So then what I'll do is like, I wanna get rid of that stuff. I'll select this column and duplicate it. And then, oh, if only I could just hit S for source and it would, hey, that was nice. Thanks so much, Media Composer. And I'll go to source and I'll wipe those all out by duplicating nothing onto the columns. Uh, so these are a couple uh, things to go along with the old standbys, which is if you type something, I say this is tape one. Whoops, don't know what I did there. One. Oh, I can't, sorry. Can't enter that field, can I? Right, so it has to be something where I can enter in some information. And when you hit return, it goes to the next field, so you can really quickly go through, you know, obviously these are um, only notes for Neo or uh, Mr. Mixelplictic from the DC universe, I think. Uh, but I can just go through there, and then if I hit tab, it goes to the next column to the left, or shift tab goes to the next column. Sorry, I meant to say right before. And of course, if return goes down, then shift, oops, sorry, tab, tab, shift return goes up. So again, as long as you can keep your hands on the keyboard, you're usually working a lot faster. So as an assistant, I got really fast at just manual typing and tabbing and hitting return and just putting in all sorts of information and metadata. Uh, you know, back in my day, you had to add your own metadata. It didn't just come on the footage like you whippersnappers today get to use. Stupid metadata. All right. Uh, I do have to share that one of my avid colleagues overheard one of the clients at Al Jazeera America refer to the process of adding metadata as metadating, which made it sound a lot more exciting, I think, than it really was. All right, so um, 
Other things that are really kind of cool in the um, media composer universe help you with media management. So for example, I can select this sequence and go to my hamburger menu and choose uh, select media relatives. And then it should show me in all open bins uh, any other, probably because I had that column selected, it didn't work. Let me do this again. So I'll open up a couple of bins of source footage that are part of this project. And then we'll, again, try this again, select the sequence, select media relatives. There we go. And now I can see, oh, those are the relatives of the sequence. In other words, those clips are in the sequence. And let's say I needed to delete some media that's not in the sequence. Well, now all I have to do is select all the things that aren't selected. Of course, that's kind of daunting because as soon as I click something, all the things that are selected are going to disappear. So that's why I like to use reverse selection, right? And then in that bin right there, it reverses the selection, selecting what was once deselected, deselecting what once was selected, and now I can hit delete and delete some clips and or media files uh, doing that. Um, there are other things like select offline items, select uh, sources. So if I'm over here and, you know, again, I want to see connections between the media, that's definitely very helpful. Um, another fun thing to do is to go to the frame view, where like Final Cut Pro, you have a bunch of minuscule frames which give you almost no information whatsoever. But unlike Final Cut, a little keyboard shortcut, Command L makes the frames larger and Command K makes them smaller. Get on a PC, make the translation control for the command key and you have the same shortcuts. So I can make these larger and then fit them in the window with, uh, where are we? Uh, sorry, thank you, fill window. Um, one nice thing about these frames, though, is not only, well, that, I'm not sure what's in that shot. I'd like to display a different head frame there. So I can just select it and use the space bar or JKL on my keyboard to go through and play the clip. If you have a, a nitrous box or an AJA or Blackmagic card plugged into your system, as these frames play in the bin, they also play full screen on your external monitor. You hear the audio through your mixer. So this is a really quick way to actually go through some of your footage. Not only can you play these frames, but if I mark an in point, just as that guy is walking across the street, and then I mark an out point where that guy is pointing you know, the car, uh, look, there's the marked clip already. So playing these frames can uh, definitely be a, a pretty fun thing to do. Um, if you happen to have sequences and clips in the same bin at the same time, and it's kind of hard to see which is which, there's a bin setting. Here's another uh, hint. I just hit Command Plus. Command Plus is a shortcut that will open the settings for whatever your active window is. So I had a bin active. When I hit Command Plus, it opened up bin settings. If I was in the Composer window, Command Plus brings up Composer settings, Timeline window, Timeline settings. Uh, you will no doubt discover this on your own coming from Final Cut Pro as you try to zoom in on the timeline and that dialogue pops up with timeline settings all the time and you look for the timeline checkbox that says turn back into Final Cut Pro. All right. So um, now that we have uh, oh, bin settings, got to open that. Oh, it's not a bin setting. I just remembered it's an interface setting. So if I hit I, again, another shortcut, it jumps the, the settings. You can just hit M, and it goes to the first setting that begins with M, and G goes to general. I'm going to interface, and I'm going to go ahead and maybe it wasn't bin settings. I'm sorry. I'm trying to go too fast. There it is. Show border colors. So I can use the border based on object type. So now sequences get a red border and other clips get a green border. This is right out of NewsCutter, the somewhat discontinued Avid software that's now just an option that you add on to Media Composer. Uh, you can also have it um, work with one of your other panes. So if I have some clips that are color labeled yellow and other ones that are uh, color labeled green, all right, um, in this window I could also say, no, nah, let's use local clip color instead, 
All right, now I know which ones are the green ones and which ones are the yellow ones. You can even choose to show the icons, which kind of makes maybe the colors uh, uh, not as uh, cool, but it's uh, helpful, I think, in this view. Um, this is one of my favorite tricks ever, though. Uh, there's a comments column, all right? But I don't see it. Turn left. Uh, now, if I go to choose columns and I look for the word, you know, comments, I'm not going to find it. And I look down here, I don't find it. It's nowhere. There is no comments column. Do you believe me? Without zooming in? All right. So I'm going to go to script view, where there is a comments field. And I'm going to type in anything. This is a comment. As soon as you do that, when you turn back to list view, there is now a comments column on the far right. It has now appeared. If I go to choose columns, it's literally in the list now where it was not before. All right, and um, I'm gonna drag this all the way to the left. Another trick, if you don't like the little do -si do of trying to drag and scroll and drag and scroll and it doesn't quite show up at the end, uh, what you can do is this little scrolling area here, as long as you drag the, the field or the column to the left of that, then it goes to the far left, okay? So this is a comment column, and now if you save this in a bin view, you'll never have to go searching for it again. Um, this weird bug or whatever this behavior is bothers me in particular because in an interplay environment, when you have the asset management system that uh, Avid provides for a lot of their high-end clients, there's a comments field in Interplay that maps any information from the comments field for Media Composer, only you have to use the, at, the Avid comments column, not your own custom column, uh, for those things to map over. Okay. Um, all righty. I'm going to load up a different project, uh, or projet, as my uh, friends up in Canada would say. And... Um, this is a little piece from one of my former UCLA students. Uh, he did it about a, a bunch of thieves on their first heist. So um, anyway, this is a delightful little story of uh, a little puppet cop and everything. And uh, eventually something goes terribly, terribly wrong, uh, as you can see right here, because uh, something terribly begun gets knocked out of his hand and it flies across the screen in slow-mo. And now this is just horrible. This is awful. Yes, yes, it's true. There is a gun sound effect on the source dialogue tracks. Ah! Now, in my own defense, I did that the second I heard you complain about that so that we could have a little fun here. Um, here's an old myth, by the way. Yeah. Um, in Media Composer, you used to not be able to do this, but now you can. I can actually select uh, this stuff and drag it down multiple tracks like you used to be able to uh, in Final Cut. And it doesn't lose the transitions anymore. Uh, I can move this stuff you know, left and right. Uh, so that's a, a good thing to do. So let's say uh, a little bit earlier, uh, let's see, I have a layout, a window layout that has some markers in it. And there's, what's the one I'm looking for? Ah, yes, we want to do some loop selected clips. All right, so we have a sequence. And in this sequence, the cop walks up to the window to confront. Well, heck, let's just do the shift command F style with full screen. Good evening, boys. Mind rolling down the window? Oh, I thought I rendered those effects. Oh, well. Hello, officer. How are you? Good evening, sir. You boys have any idea why I pulled you over? No. <laughs> Not at all, no. <laughs> well, it appears that your car matches the description of a car seen fleeing a candy store robbery. Okay, know anything about that? What's a candy store? No, no, sir. None at all. No. Nope. All right. So, uh, that what's a candy store line was from a different take, but I found it so funny, I had to put it back into the uh, 
into the cut. Now this isn't necessarily a little known avid trick, but I once got into my one and only flame war on the internet with an editor that accused me, an avid editor, of being pretentious and, and possessive of my editing tools by saying, I know that never happens, uh, by saying that uh, being able to trim in real time was better than not, say. And uh, I'm gonna hold down shift and option and lasso this clip so I can go straight into, hello, that was supposed to work. I'm supposed to lasso them in my slide trim mode. All right, and while playing a loop here. Do you know anything about that? What's a candy store? No. All right, being able to kind of loop in real time or play yeah, this thing back in real time. Do you know anything about that? helps me try to use my own sensibilities, my comic timing. When is it funnier for that line to appear? And at least in my judgment, playing a couple frames earlier or a couple frames later actually makes the line funnier, all right? And how do I know that? Because there's a mathematical theorem about what makes things funny? No, because if there were, Dane Cook would be funny, right? But there isn't, clearly. So it's instant, right? It's like art. I don't know it, but you know, I don't know how to describe it, but that makes me laugh. Uh, I also find the softer the voice is, the funnier it is. If you can just barely overhear it, I find that to be funny. So how quick can you make those decisions and then audition them again uh, for yourself? That's kind of um, you know, one of the questions. So let's say I'm trying to get a better delivery of his, the cop's line here. Uh, let's see, do you mind? I forget which one it was. I think it was rolling down the window. No. No, a little bit earlier. Hold on. Oh, I probably put a marker in there where it was supposed to be. Yeah, there we go. New clip for this. You boys have any idea why I pulled you over? All right, now that take doesn't look that well. I think there was a sync problem because his lips didn't quite match the sounds that were coming out of his mouth. So I'm gonna go look for a different take where we don't have that issue. Well, each of these takes, if I hit play and out. You boys have any idea why I pulled you over? And then I'll load the next clip, play and out. You boys have any idea why I pulled you over? And auditioning this way, even if I've got the, the marks preset, there's too much time in between each take for me to really compare them because I got to, you know, load one and then I got to hit play. All right. And so that's why there's a really cool feature. If I select all of these takes and in the bin menu, choose loop selected clips. Is there anyone who's used this before? All right. So this is awesome, right? I'll just choose this and it loads the first one into the source monitor. You boys have any idea why I pulled you over? Then it loads the second. You boys have any idea why I pulled you over? Then the third. You boys have any idea why I pulled you over? Then the fourth. You boys have any idea why I pulled you over? And then it goes back to the beginning again until you hit the space bar or something. Um, now it used to be that I think, actually this might have existed the whole time, but this is a feature I, I got used to um, in sync based editing using script sync, which was uh, a really great Avid technique for uh, basically importing a script and lining it up and, and being able to audition things that way. Uh, if you don't have script sync, uh, this is the nearest equivalent, so you can compare a bunch of things uh, together. Uh, then of course, if I want to swap that out, you know, you've got replace edit functions and, and all sorts of other things you can do. Um, alrighty. Uh, meanwhile, I've been using something called link settings to switch between my assemble edit kind of workspace. This one's for sound mixing. You can see I've got my audio mixing tools and uh, if I have a uh, sequence loaded up in there, um, this particular layout has activated a mixing uh, timeline view that has different colors and it has the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, maybe track heights that I like. Um, I have another view for effect editing. Again, it has a totally different timeline view called effects. And the way this works is all of your workspaces, if you go to properties, you have the ability to link them to name settings. All you have to do is name a setting with the same term, in this case effects, and when I choose my effect workspaces, any setting, like this keyboard layout, effects, like this timeline view, effects, they all activate at once. 
So if I'm trying to work on a sequence and I really want to do a quick trim or I want to do a quick jump into effect mode. Oh yeah, this is how they get away. Gotta love this. I'm sorry, I just have to show this because it's so funny. Really, really way too creative uh, on my students' part. All right, now you're seeing things like I hid the tracks, all right, so show track, I can hide or show different tracks. They're there, but they're not, my audio uh, tracks aren't wasting space on my timeline that I'd like to devote only to the video layers while I do some compositing. And when I'm in my audio mixing layout, you know, I could take all the video tracks and select them and then do shift command H, which hides selected, or go to the menu and, uh, you know, again, choose that option from show track. Um, there's also, of course, the, the track color that you see where I want my audio tracks uh, for dialogue to be green and I want the sound effects to be purple and I want the music to be blue. And then I have an idea of what's on the different tracks. Now, why would I want to know that? Right, so here's the thing, if, if, now I'm a neurotic Jew, so I, if, if I'm going to offend someone I'm working with or make their job harder, that's like the worst thing in the world to me. So a long time ago, I started talking to the Pro Tools mixer I was working with at the beginning of the project saying, how do you like your stuff delivered, right? And then I do that thing. Over time, I've learned a couple of important things. Can you write that down? Yeah. You, you do, the, I do that thing. Right, because at that point of the of the process, they're on the they're under the pressure, right? Because typically all the stuff has been pushed to the end, and then the mix has to be delivered like in two hours because the premiere is in three hours. So you don't want to have those kinds of surprises. So whether you've named your tracks or not, which is a nice thing to do, I can go in here and you know rename a track and have it say dialogue or something. But just keeping it separate is a really important thing. The other thing that I've learned is that approximately, it's either on the way into the Pro Tools project or approximately five seconds after it's open, all of your volume automation and other kinds of effects will probably be removed by the Pro Tools artist. Now, mostly it's because they have the better sound effects and the better uh, tools and the better ear and everything, but mostly it's out of spite. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. Um, so I don't tend to spend a lot of time tweaking audio and everything. Uh, but if I were to spend a lot of time, say again, I got two minutes left? That's it. Oh, wow, I was trying to go faster. All right, so really quickly, uh, new audio keyboard shortcuts for adjusting gain in your sequences, all right? If you do shift option, up or down arrow, that's actually, well, let me do it over this one so you can actually see what's happening. Shift up or down arrow, sorry, shift option up arrow is actually moving clip gain up one dB at a time or down one dB at a time. If I add keyframes, all right, and again, you can lasso them now, which is really cool. I can do shift command up and down arrow to move them up or down or shift command left or right arrow to move them left or right. All right, we're gonna go really, really quickly. Uh, if you wanted to load something to use in your sequence for later, uh, say this clip right here, I wanna mark it and subclip it or something, maybe copy it. If you hit C, you can go to the monitor here in the source side and choose clipboard contents. But if you just do uh, option C, it automatically subclips that information into your monitor without you having to do it in two steps. I could do option X and it would do a extract and put that contents in the source monitor. Uh, so that's a really cool one to do. Um, trying to find out if we have just a few more to do, what's one of the coolest ones. Uh, all of your windows will react to edit set font, you can actually change the text size to something really large. Now I have much bigger time code or in the bin set font, I have much bigger uh, text there. Um, one of my favorite things was if I were to export an AAF of this right now, um, export still be on AAF, yeah, 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 okay. 
and desktop. Uh, there's a, a program called Muse ID. That's M-U-S dot ID. You might want to look this up. Uh, there's often a time at the end of the project when you've got to go through here and figure out where all your sound effects and your music cues and all sorts of other things uh, are, and you have to, you know, get, you have to pay for clearances, do all sorts of other things. Um, so, in this particular uh, case, I might, as an assistant editor, go through and like name all the different audio things, SFX or VO, so that I could go print out a marker list, which was an old thing that people used to do uh, back in the day. You just choose file, oh sorry, it's down here in the hamburger menu, export markers as a text file, all right, and I'll just do all, desktop, all right, and if I open up the text file, there it is, a whole list of things, and if I happen to have Microsoft Word, all right, open, I can paste it. Oh, that was not the right copy. Where are we, text edit? Copy, and then paste, and then I'm gonna select all this text and choose the formatting option called table, convert text to table, it automatically senses all of the tab delineated stuff that added through in there. Then I'll go down here to copy it from this particular thing. And I've made my template a long time ago so that you can see what everything is. Now the colors that I've used, I know what the color coding is. Magenta means sound effects and yellow means music. So I could just do a find here uh, and replace, you know, do a search and replace and replace magenta with SFX, so you, you'd output, you know, different lists for sound effects and whatnot. But now with this AAF, there's a Muse ID reporting application. I can just drag and drop it, and it says it's written the report to the same directory. Is that the right one, or is this it? Yeah, there it is. Let's have it, ta-da, ah, there we go. So this information was all in this particular music file. It's the, what do you call it, ID3 or, all sorts of metadata built into the files. This Muse ID application has an AMA or linking plugin that actually extracts all this data, passes it along to an Avid bin view they've created, and then you can export this. So if you have to do a music cue sheet or uh, get timings, there's your in, your out, your duration. Most of the other information I don't really care about. Um, but I think this holds a lot of promise for people who have to output uh, music cue sheets or um, you know writes forms and stuff at the end of the project. So there's a lot of little stuff in there that you know Avid only uh, gives you. Hell, you can even just print your bin. I'll just open it as a PDF, right? And look, there's some information. Whatever columns you're showing in your bin uh, show up and you can share some information with people. So that's really a, a really great um, thing to get out of Media Composer. Uh, I feel like I wanted the really cool uh, thing. I'll do one more. Uh, there's a nice transition option. You get the quick transition key. You get to choose any of a number of transitions in this list, but that's it. And then you can add them. Well, if you're in your project and you create a bin called quick transitions with a S at the end of it, uh, I will open up an effects bin that has a couple of effects in it. I'll throw in, I think I have some transitions. Nope, those look like transitions. Let me just really quickly save one. Here's a transition, it's a dissolve, it's saved to a bin. All right, and then now I will throw it in the quick transitions bin and I will call it finale effect. All right, as long as you have a bin called Quick Transitions in your uh, project, when you use the Quick Transition window, anything in that bin will show up in the list. All right, uh, what I didn't get to show you is all sorts of things like console commands that'll let you do things like modify how Media Composer works, uh, make certain drives not writable, make other drives writable, and uh, even the thing that uh, Shane mentioned earlier, not being able to load pre-computes into a source monitor, there's a, even a console command in Media Composer, you can do that. 
So uh, should you ever want to find out more, um, I you know, am an independent trainer, so uh, I do house calls. Uh, you have a couple things on my site that I've created for people ahead of time that I would like people to maybe check out at editdog.com. And that includes, includes my command matrices. So if you are trying to learn Media Composer, and I strongly urge people to, because it's pretty popular, uh, these lists basically translate Final Cut 7, which a lot of us have as a common base, into all the Avid commands. And it's going to show you things that don't even have shortcuts mapped, the different buttons, uh, different things in uh, Media Composer that really have no analog. Uh, you get expl explanations of the tools, explanations of various you know, pop-up menus and fast menus. And basically, if you want to search, like where is the match frame command, right? It helps you find uh, where those commands are and translate things you know in Final Cut to Avid. So there's a Final Cut 7 to Avid, Final Cut 7 to Premiere, and a Final Cut 7 to Final Cut 10 uh, on uh, editdog.com. So I hope you'll uh, check that out. And I really do encourage people to take another look at Media Composer because some of the stuff that's been in there forever and that hasn't changed to get with the times, it's really important stuff like frame accurate trimming, like being able to uh, chop off your tops and tails really quickly, like things that have to be done in a, in a professional collaborative environment that you don't necessarily have to do in uh, a solo environment. So uh, I wish I had more time, but uh, those are some of the fun things. I will probably put my uh, list of all these tricks on my website, on my blog, Bleeding Purple. So if you didn't write down some notes, you wanted to see some of the things that you missed, I'll probably have this up in my blog in a couple days. All right? So should I take Steve a Steve Gander, everybody. There you go.